What an honor for us to be back together again. You're in my living room. I'm with you in your home or in your car, wherever you may be. But we're connected by the beautiful presence of the living God. You know, one of my favorite scriptures, and I got a few, but 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says this. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. Can you just imagine that? God wants to exalt you, promote you. What a great promoter he is. He knows how to do it. You might ask, well, how does he do it, Pastor Stephen? It's pretty easy. He has us submit to his word. That's why coming together to his word is so important as the family of God. So let's just welcome the Holy Spirit right now to help us. Precious Holy Spirit, we just welcome you into our lives, our homes, wherever we are, maybe traveling. And we just ask you, precious Holy Spirit, to breathe your breath on the Holy Word of God, that it may find its mark in our heart and we will never be the same again. This is going to be a day to remember. This is going to be a week to remember in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, heaven is real. Here we go, part three. I am so excited about this message for you and for me. From the start of this series, we've been profoundly impacted by the reality of God's eternal hope for us. But in addition to that, we suddenly realize that heaven is even part of who we are. It's a part of our identity. It is Heaven touches our identity, Pastor Stephen. Where did you get that? Well, in part one, we read this. Remember this, Philippians 3, verse 20. But we are different because our citizenship is in heaven. So if you're a Christian, you're a citizen of heaven. If you're a Jesus believer, you're a citizen of heaven. If you believe the Bible and call Jesus your Savior, that's right, you're a citizen of heaven of heaven. That's why your life here on earth has to reflect the governing principles and guidelines and laws of heaven's, heaven's government, heaven's governing principles. Reinhard Bonnke once said this, he said, we're going to plunder hell and populate heaven. But that's a task for those of us on earth who believe, God, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So let's just review a little bit of even part two. In part two, we talked about the genius of Jesus giving us a heavenly perspective to live the abundant life here on earth. It's absolutely genius. It's heavenly satellite accuracy. In the short time that I've been preaching this series, I want you to know something. I've had people so close to me that suddenly, unexpectedly had dear loved ones leave this mortal life just in this short time of preaching this series. So do we think death or do we think immortality? Do we think ah, it's hopeless or do we say, yes, heaven is real. It doesn't mean we don't mourn, but we don't mourn or grieve like the world does. We have a great hope, an eternal hope. You see, they're not dead, but more alive in Christ than anyone on planet Earth. Yes, they've moved. That's why we mourn. We miss them. But Jesus, the Word, was made flesh to save us and give us an eternal home in heaven. Yes, heaven is real. And so we live, walk, and talk that reality, that hope daily here on Earth. I love what Jesus said to all of us in John 8, verse 51. He said, I assure you, and most solemnly I say this to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will indeed never, ever see and experience death. I believe Jesus. How about you? I don't believe the entertainment world and fairy tales or false religion. I believe what Jesus says. He says that anyone living in him will never, ever, ever see death. That doesn't mean we won't take, take off mortality and put on immortality, but he says we will never ever see death. You know what that means? That means that the precious husband who just died in that tragic plane accident never experienced or saw death. He went from a mortal consciousness into an immortal reality, being face to face with Jesus, the King of Kings, in a paradise that makes this world look weak, shabby, empty, fragile, and colorless. 
Not because this world is supposed to be that way, but it's been under the curse of sin for thousands of years. So we don't realize how much it's devolved, right? Isn't it funny how the secular world is so set on promoting evolution like, look at us, we're going forward, when the reality is degeneration, de evolution if there is such a thing. Our sin is breaking us. And this planet, that's why God's plan has always been to make a new heaven and a new earth. It's a plan of restoration, rebirth, and transformation. Oh, I love those words. But Jesus does it. You don't do it. We don't do it. Not me. Jesus, the King, does it. So for the family crying right now because their dad has passed on, for that precious wife who's now become a widow. Heaven is real, so your hope is alive. Your loved one has changed their address, yes, but leaving this mortal reality in Christ Jesus is instantly being with the master in heaven. So we can rejoice even through the tears in this great hope, this great truth. There's a party coming and the best days are still ahead. Death has not won. Death is not victorious. It's been utterly humiliated before the realms of eternity. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55. Oh grave, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? So this message is for now. That's right. Right now, you and I need this truth because we will not be pushed around any longer by threats of the unknown, the temporary state of mortality. Yes, heaven is real, and that's how we live life strong here on this earth. So let's build on this truth about heaven. Jesus said this. He said, let him who has eyes to see perceive. Let him who has ears to hear, hear and understand. The truth is, you and I often see things dimly right now. No matter how good your vision is, what makes you think you're seeing even a portion of the dimensions and reality around you? There are still so many things we don't understand and that science is in a race to quantify. And yet we, humanity, have the audacity to think that we can make this independent measurement of life based on our minuscule existence it's hilarious. How could we ever imagine to exist physically or spiritually without the warrant, the consent, or creative power of the intelligent designer, the ancient one, God Almighty? Oh, one of the greatest deceptions is self-deception, thinking you see when you really don't see. We think we know, but do we really? Compared to all that truly exists, you observe a little and you should be thankful for all that you do perceive, but don't let it intoxicate your ego to believe that somehow you know something apart from God because as they say, yeah, you don't know Jack. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 says this, for now we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim blurred reflection of reality as in a riddle or an enigma. But then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. Now I know in part imperfectly, but then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. Now, what's the difference between, quote, now only a dim reflection and, quote, then we shall see in reality, end quote. God's talking about the difference between now, this mortal season, and then being in the immortal season talked about in greater lengths in a few chapters later in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You see, earth is not the opposite of heaven. Earth is a type and shadow of God's place, heaven. Of course, the invasive disease of sin has made earth at times look like a, a petri dish for hell with wars, destruction, injustice, sickness. But God sent the kingdom of heaven through his son Jesus to earth to help us walk in dominion and authority. Once he dealt with our sin problem at the cross, still we're in this process and, quote, looking through a glass at a dim reflection of reality. That's the truth. You see, Gnosticism believes that all physical matter is evil and that only the spirit world is good. The Bible completely contradicts that. God created the physical world and the universe, and he said when he made it that it was good. Not bad, but good. 
Satan is terrified of you and I understanding this. You see, God is in the transformation business, the resurrection business, the restoration operation. And we got to get the dim out of our eyes to go forward. Mankind's sin has made it so that the best of earth is now just a faint type and shadow of the realities of heaven. So let me say it another way. Whatever is of any value or beauty on earth, it's but a weak, faint hint of even the least of things in heaven. And yes, I did say things. There are things in heaven. There are animals. There are instruments. There are foods. There are voices. There are clothes and on and on. Hebrews 8 verse 5, talking about earthly things related to the things in heaven and their root existence. Listen to this. Hebrews 8 5, they serve as a pattern. The things here on earth serve as a pattern and a foreshadowing of what has its true existence in reality. Where? In heavenly things. Did you hear that? Earthly things serve as a foreshadowing of the heavenly reality of stuff. So what do you enjoy here on earth? Family, friends, fun, sports, running, adventures, mountains, rivers, swimming, The best of what you see in this reality is but a faint whisper of the beauty and the fun and joy in heaven. God hates sin, but he doesn't dislike things. He made things. He's not an anti-matter God. He made it. Remember, God doesn't toss us away. He transforms us. He restores us. He can redeem matter, molecules, referring to the new Jerusalem, which is the city of God that descends out of the new heaven and connects the new earth to God's present home. Check this out. Revelation 21, verse 21. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each separate gate being built of one solid pearl. And the main street, the Broadway of the city, was of gold as pure and translucent as glass. My friend, there are streets, gates, gigantic pearls, gold so pure that you can see through it. Yes, there are nations, languages. There is north and south. There is east and west. Yes, there will be matter and things meant to bless you, things to enjoy. Now, that's exciting, isn't it? If you don't have a burst of hope thinking of heaven, then you're not dialing in on God's reality. Hopelessness comes from only thinking laterally. No vertical, just lateral. Warren Buffett once said this. He said, he said, I know people who have a lot of money, but the truth is that nobody in the world loves them. That's the ultimate test of life, end quote. Now, you see, he was alluding to that's lateral thinking. See, Jesus put it in this way. He said, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You find that in Mark 8, verse 36. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19 says this. If we who are abiding in Christ have hope only in this life, and that is all, he's saying, if we abiding in Christ only have a lateral hope, he says, then we are of all people most miserable and to be pitied. We learn that the disciples were standing next to Jesus and they were troubled, imagine that, worried. They were unhappy right next to Jesus. You see, because they didn't have an accurate biblical view beyond this mortal life. They'd put all their chips on this mortal life. Why are you so sad, Mr. Disciple? Why are you so sad, Mr. or Miss Christian? Oh, well, I thought knowing Jesus was the band-aid that made us all happy and blessed. Let's get some understanding on this. When you've been saved by Jesus, you have the right and the privilege and the authority to be happy and blessed. You've been given authority to exercise your rights of blessing, but you have to activate them, exercise them. You can't get saved, stay worldly minded and have a carnal perspective and think that you'll be happy. Paul, the apostle in 1 Corinthians 10, he actually said this. He said, you can't eat at the Lord's table, which we're going to do later. You can't eat at the Lord's table and then eat at a demon's table. You can't sing Jesus is Lord and then on Monday sing I did it my way. In fact, we just read from God's word that you will be most miserable and to be pitied. Now imagine a news heading online. Man saved from great white sharks jumps back in to swim with 
White sharks, as he's being eaten, cries out, I thought I was saved. Could that be how strange we are with Christ's salvation? Pulled out, but jumping back in? Do we do that? Have you ever noticed how people in the world who don't believe in Jesus, mock his morals and guidelines, actually pity some Christians? Why is that? Because a born-again child of God that doesn't take advantage of his or her advantage is the most miserable of all people. You're free from maximum security, but yet you choose every day to not sign the release forms and take off your prison clothes. You know, in the book of Genesis, where Joseph was released from prison, the very first thing he did was take off his prison clothes and get a bath and cleaned up and shaved. You see, we get so afraid of losing a few of our worldly possessions that we don't want to part with the familiarity, the familiarity of what our life once was. Oh, I've had those striped clothes so long. I've had them so long, and my grandfather handed those old shoes down to me. My great-grandmother gave us that tradition, and well, you know, you understand, it's family. Blood is thicker than water. With all of our sense and reason, we trade a higher heavenly mindset for a lower spiritually dysfunctional perspective that compromises our peace and joy that Jesus has already given to us. You keep wearing prison clothes because blood is thicker than water? Whose blood? Family? Genetics? Look, if you're going to live with Father God forever, you better get used to right now a new bloodline. And I mean no respect, disrespect to your family or your traditions, but the truth is Jesus came to save us from our genetics and all that, that predisposed brokenness. So let it go. Don't be one of those people who celebrate your ancestry because it entitles you to certain behaviors, outbursts, and broken thinking, all of which are convenient to your addictions, bad habits, and inability to take personal responsibility. Then the moment the doctor says that you're predisposed to some disease or an early death, then it's like, oh, Jesus, you got to save me from this rich, wretched man or woman that I am. Mark Twain once said this, he said, in an answer to a newspaper editor about his health, he wrote this. He said, I have heard on good authority that I was dead. He said, the report of my death has been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> my friend, through Jesus' death on the cross, we cease to exist to the power of the curse. We take advantage of that and we start living in God's will here on earth as it is in heaven today. Jesus, the only begotten son, was born into this world, lived a perfect life with no sin. He did die on the cross for our sins, but the Holy Spirit rose him up from the grave. And now he is seated at the right hand of the heavenly father on high. Where? In heaven, on the heavenly throne, where all true authority, rule, dominion, and power issue from. So how does the reality of heaven truly impact our life here on earth. This is important. Let me share with you a tale of two women. This is really the story of the wife and mother of a young man that passed away too early in life. Pam and I were good friends with Trent and his beautiful wife, Tammy, and their family. It was one day right before the infamous 9-11, and I was expecting a call from Trent because he and Tammy were coming back from a missions trip. His caller ID came up, but when I answered the phone, it was Tammy crying. She was saying she couldn't find Trent. He went diving, and now they couldn't find him. It was a sleepless night that night, wondering, praying. And then, of course, waking up to the tragedy of 9-11 happening live on the news. And I got this phone call from Trent's brother telling me that they found Trent's body. And it just felt like the world was imploding, falling apart, coming apart at the seams. But as I said, this is the tale of two women. Over the next years, Pam and I watched as both Trent's wife and Trent's mom became more and more focused on expressing their heaven on earth attitude, but in very different ways. Tammy, she began to communicate to thousands upon thousands of women dealing with their own goodbyes and sorrows and their own pain. And often her message was marked by great joy and laughter, even in the midst and through the tears. She refused to live in the past because guess what? God's best 
was still ahead of her. There's an eternity waiting for her. Sally Ann, on the other hand, trans mom, she became even more of a mother. Instead of pulling back in fear of loss, she invested more into others. She took her broken heart to the cross and let Jesus turn it into an outpouring of perfume like the woman with the alabaster box. She became even more of a mom. She became even more of a grandmother. It's the tale of two women, both with, yeah, a heartbreaking loss, but both with a yes, heaven is real. You see, it's their vertical mindset guiding their lateral living. They don't live under a mantle of loss, but every day they gain momentum here on earth in this life. They haven't lost Trent. He's in their future. Their eternal, everlasting, amazing, joy forever, heavenly future. My friend, what's in your future? Oh, I know what God's planned for you. I know what God's love has prepared for you. I opened up this whole series with Jesus' words, giving us insight into Father God's family plan. You want to hear it again? John 14, verse 2, Jesus says, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, homes. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I'm going away to prepare a place for you. My friend, you matter. Your life is essential not just to you, but to the God who created you. God has a heaven plan for you, and it starts today here on earth with an overflow of joy, peace, love. Look, if God prepared a perfect Eden with such an eye for detail and beauty, just imagine the amazing multiplied, amped up version of paradise that heaven is going to be for you and I. Come on. If Warren Buffett knows that you can have all the money but are a failure without love, shouldn't you and I take the advice of God who owns the earth and the fullness of it and come to His Son, Jesus, let go of the past and walk into His divine dimension, the kingdom of God here on earth. Do it now. Pray this with me because God takes your confession of faith so very, very seriously. Pray this. Dear Lord Jesus, I want heaven to be my eternal home. I want your love activated in my life today. Once I rejected you, forgive me for my foolishness. Once I put all my trust in this life, but I need your life. You died on the cross for me. God raised you up from the grave. Through you, Jesus, I have complete victory over death. I'm now born again. I belong to the family of God. All in Jesus' name. Amen. Congratulations. You're a child of God. Now it's time to activate God's benefits in your life here on earth, just as they are in heaven. Like I said earlier, you don't get saved out of the shark infested waters to turn around and jump back in them, do you? Now you need to grow in God's wisdom for living here on earth with an eternal perspective, a vertical straight edge of accurate guidance. We get that. We've got just the tools to help you. Go to our website and tell us what God has done for you. There's a Jesus button there, and then you'll find lots of free tools for growth, encouragement, podcasts to help keep your mind set on the truth and overcoming. This week, everything can change, my dear friend, as you use your faith, your trust to activate God's plans in your life.